I must admit I find it frustrating when people say that if Nibiru was real, why hasn't it been in the news? Well, it has been. Han tried desperately to play it down. Possibly in his haste, he also let slip a little secret of NASA. That is, when data comes in that they can't hide, just come up with an alternative explanation to throw people off. And that is why people always use the acronym of NASA to mean never a straight answer. Hi, I'm Jim Green, Director of Planetary Science at NASA. Last July 14th, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto, capping a half century of exploration of our solar system. It piqued our interest about what lies beyond Pluto and what can we learn about ourselves and the origins of our solar system. The idea of a new planet is certainly an exciting one for me as a planetary scientist, and I think for all of us. The January 20th paper in the Astronomical Journal is fueling our interest in planetary exploration and stimulating a healthy debate that's part of the scientific process. I couldn't be more pleased about what's happening. You know, it's all about starting the process that could lead to an exciting result. It is not, however, the detection of a new planet. It's too early to say with certainty that there is a so-called Planet X out there. What we're really seeing is an early prediction based on modeling from limited observations. What's exciting is that, like NASA's journey to Mars or New Horizons flyby of Pluto, you will have a front row seat to see how the scientific process unfolds. Theories like this serve to stimulate ideas and conversation. They tap into our innate curiosity. It's important for us to continue to work, and we will. Anytime we have an interesting idea like this, we always apply Carl Sagan's rules for critical thinking, which include independent confirmation of the facts, looking for alternate explanations, and encouraging scientific debate. If Planet X is out there, we'll find it together. Or we'll determine an alternate explanation for the data that we've received so far. Or we'll determine an alternate explanation. Determine an alternate explanation for the data that we've received so far. Or we'll determine an alternate explanation for the data that we've received so far. Alternative Explanation 1 Admit that there is a giant rogue planet, but say it is so far away that it poses no real threat. Make sure you never call it Nibiru. Give it a new name like Planet 9. That way, no one can Google the name and learn anything about the truth of it. There might be a whole new planet on the other side of Pluto. It's named 2012 VP113, jokingly dubbed Biden. Get it? Uh, Corey Powell's editor at large for Discover Magazine and Studio. How you doing, Corey? Uh, VP Biden. Right on. There we go. <laughs> Correct on that. Two images show you. This is the arrow obviously pointing to it. But there are three dots on here. One is red, one is green, one is blue. Right. What's significant? So this is, this is the actual discovery image. Basically, Two astronomers were looking, one little patch of sky very, very far away, looking for exactly this kind of thing. Stars don't move. Planets or anything that's like a planet does. Mm -hmm. So this is color-coded. This is what they saw on different nights. They were looking for one thing moving. They color-coded it to, to show that all these stars are staying still. This thing is moving, and the way it's moving... So this is just one... It's one object, color-coded. Is three, Pluto three on this? Pluto's in a whole different part of the sky. So this is way out there. This is way out there. Well, this is more, is than, it, more than twice as far away as Pluto. Unbelievable. Why does this matter, Corey? Well, there are two ways you can look at it. I think you know, I look at it, first of all, as, a, as an exploration question. That there, you know, We know where we are on Earth. We've mapped our planet. Our solar system is still terra incognita. It's full of surprises. This object is something that astronomers said shouldn't even be there. There's a whole other solar system beyond the planets that we know that are full of these things that are sort of planets, sort of comets, 
some of them they call dwarf planets, that's what they're calling this one. What we're seeing is, we're seeing our neighborhood, we're seeing what's around us, and then the second part, we're seeing where we came from. Mm -hmm. We're seeing where we came from. Mm -hmm. The oft-contested designation of Pluto as the ninth planet is back in the news again today. The California Institute of Technology published a study claiming they have discovered a true ninth planet beyond Pluto. For the first time in 170 years, evidence of this ninth planet was found on the far edge of the system. Astronomers at this, the California Institute of Technology have not directly seen it yet but they think it's up to 10 times bigger than Earth and 20 times farther away than Neptune. Two scientists at Caltech say they've discovered a ninth planet in the outer corners of our solar system. It's pretty exciting to know it's out there and waiting to be found. Two years ago, we realized that there was something funny going on in the outer solar system. What these orbits are, are showing us, they're showing us sort of a gravitational one-way sign towards the existence of an additional body. These researchers say for the last 13 years, a handful of objects have been found by other astronomers, and all of these objects swing in the same direction. That can't happen by chance. So we knew something funny was going on. Many may remember Mike Brown for his role in demoting Pluto as a planet about a decade ago. What's the evidence that it's there? So the evidence is that we can look at objects orbiting around our solar system and figure out why their motions are the way they are because of the gravitational influences of everything else around. So we looked at a small group of objects newly discovered and realized we couldn't actually completely understand their motion. However, if we insert into the equation about that an object about the size of this planet nine, everything then worked out perfectly. So that's what gives the suspicion that it really does exist. They can't exactly see this thing from a telescope or, or anything like that. Instead, they are using data about uh, how other objects as far out as Pluto uh, are, are reacting and moving out of alignment, getting out of its way. So data like that actually suggest a heavy gravitational pull which primarily comes from things that are are qualified to be called planet uh, but they do have two giant telescopes on two different continents searching for the physical evidence of this thing's existence right now the best that they can say is that something really 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 big beyond pluto exists because space rocks are moving out of the way um, as well as it's causing misaligned positions uh, among the outer planets. The orbit of other celestial bodies seem to re be responding to something. What that is, nobody can actually confirm just yet. It's, it's so far away that even though it's big, it's very, very dim and it'd be very tough to spot with a telescope. I'm also fascinated at the idea that this planet could be so far out there and still our sun be the mass that is keeping it in the gravitational pull of our solar system. Right, right, yeah, but no, that's, it's true. That's incredible. And so there was a thought at one point from scientists that when they thought that there was something beyond Pluto, that it might have been all the massive objects floating in the, in the Kyber belt, but it's not. Right, so, so the, all those objects are out there and they have a lot of mass, and originally the scientists said, look, a planet is such a crazy idea, <laughs> maybe it's the Kuiper Belt itself that's pulling it on, on itself and making these, these orbits look funny. And they ran simulations and they tried to make that work and it didn't work, it mm. just didn't work. There's not enough stuff out there. So you don't see it, but you said it's all about the numbers. So two scientists are playing around with numbers and they think what? They think, huh, this doesn't add up. Yeah. We need to ask some other folks to take a look at this for us and tell us if we're crazy. And sure enough, that's what they did. The Caltech astronomers looked at the number and said, you know that idea about there being another planet? That's not a crazy idea. It looks like it's really possible. So now what they'll do is they'll let this information out to the rest of the astronomical community to try to help figure out what's going on, to make sure that everything's correct. And now they'll also do the observations. And, and some have already stepped forward to say they're convinced. Well, it is. It, it, uh, yes, they are pretty well convinced now they need the visual evidence to back it up because, yeah, as I said, the numbers yeah. don't lie. But the critics of this study say that it's possible that this, uh, this large body is simply an ancient core, a core of a, a gas giant that was ejected out to the farthest reaches of the solar system thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. What does this tell us about our solar system? Well, one thing it tells us is that we don't really understand it as well as we thought we did. <laughs> 
And another is that it probably had a very violent beginning. This thing was probably formed much closer in and then flung out, maybe in a close encounter with Jupiter or something. You mentioned that scientists haven't seen it yet because of how far away it is and yeah. how dim it is. Is there a way for them to get visual evidence? Yes, so, so the biggest telescopes in the world can theoretically see this thing if they're looking in exactly the right place. And with the publication of this new paper today, uh, they are now going to start to look in earnest. But Batygin and Brown are not the first to claim that they've discovered a new major planet beyond Neptune. In fact, the hunt for Planet X has been on for over a century. But every promising claim has ultimately been shut down by scientists. Shut down by scientists. Alternative Explanation 2 Create a joke explanation that is so ridiculous that serious people will just dismiss it and ignore further study. The previous video in which we discovered how God revealed to us the identity of the prophecy and the vision that Daniel was told to seal up. You will remember that the specific prophecy is found in Genesis 3 verse 14 to 19, and the specific vision was given to John in Revelation 12. If you have not watched the previous video, I would encourage you to do so as it provides important background information, allowing you to understand where we pick up today. You can link to the previous video in the series, by clicking it on the screen now, or by linking to it in the section below, at a time that is convenient for you. In today's video, we will take a closer look at how the sign of Revelation 12, fits into the events described in Revelation and how we can discover what God is showing us by applying the patterns found in his word. We will specifically look at another aspect that is critical in obtaining an understanding of God's timeline. And this is what is known as the Lord's Feast Days. There are seven feasts that are given to Israel to observe perpetually, and these are found in Leviticus 23. They also occur in two distinct seasons and are more commonly referred to as the spring and fall feasts. Those that occur in the spring are Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits and Pentecost. The fall season consists of the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Booths. We will demonstrate how God makes use of a clearly recognizable pattern that is applied to both seasons of appointed times, and how this pattern incorporates the Revelation 12 sign into the fall feasts. After seeing how the vision given to John in Revelation 12, is marked with a physical celestial representation, and how it is linked to the prophecy given in Genesis 3, verse 16, I wondered if God would also mark, the prophecy that was given to man, in the Garden of Eden with a similar celestial marker. This, in my opinion, would confirm and provide physical proof, for the fact that we are indeed, looking at the correct prophecy, and vision, that Daniel was told to seal up. The celestial representation and progression of stars and planets, that are associated with the Revelation 12 sign, are very complex and unique, and require a number of events in the heavens, to succeed each other, perfectly, in order to arrive at the result, as described in Revelation 12. Since no information is provided in the Bible between the creation of man, and man falling into sin, it would be logical to conclude, that the prophecy given by God in Genesis 3, must have occurred, shortly after the creation narrative. When we look at time from God's perspective, we know, that God uses a lunar calendar, when determining years, and that a year, in God's word, is 360 days long. As I searched for this marker, around 6,000 biblical years ago, I was amazed to find, that God did indeed, mark the prophecy, with the same celestial configuration, as described in Revelation 12. This event, is found to have occurred, on August 5, 3915 BC. There are then exactly 6,017 biblical years between the prophecy given by God in Genesis 3, and the fulfillment of John's vision given in Revelation 12. 
The only difference, between the two markers, is the planets and their order, that are added to the stars of the constellation Leo, to make up the twelve-starred crown, on the head of Virgo. We now have two points on this timeline, that are approximately 6,000 years apart, describing the time, between the prophecy and the vision that Daniel was told to seal up, and marking two very important events in the history of man on earth. We know that at the point that the prophecy was given, sin entered the world, and death by sin, as seen in Romans 5. Romans 5 verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Before this point, there was no death, according to God's word. At this point Satan also gained control over the world, and became the god of this world, as described in 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. It is such a privilege to know, that two thousand years ago, God provided a Savior, that was born from a virgin of the nation of Israel, just as he prophesied in Genesis 3 verse 16. This puts an additional point on the timeline, where the same event represented by the celestial markers, at the start and end point on the timeline, is fulfilled. It is very evident, when we consider these three points on the timeline, that we are once again, dealing with a repeating pattern. This means that God has hidden information for us to discover, that would give us better understanding, of the upcoming event in September 2017. I find it amazingly interesting, and at the same time, mind-boggling, to discover that God actually purposed all of this right from the beginning. Can we find any evidence in God's word, that shows us that it was his intention to hide information in this way? I believe the following two passages confirm this, and that the heavens contain a hidden message, that we will uncover as we continue. Proverbs 25 verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Psalms 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. These two passages tell us that it is God's glory to conceal information, and that the heavens play a part in telling us, what information God has concealed. It is obvious that God had a specific purpose in mind when he created the sun, the moon and the stars, and that part of their purpose, is to provide us with specific information on God's timing. When we now read Genesis 1 verse 14, knowing about these celestial signs, that are marking a specific prophecy and vision in the word of God, it is amazing to discover, that the primary purpose that God assigned to the heavenly bodies, is to serve as signals, that point out special days on God's calendar. Genesis 1 verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years. In this verse, you will note, that the order in which God assigns his purpose for the lights in the heavens, positions the function of acting as signs and for seasons, before that of measuring out days and years. Their primary purpose can therefore be seen as markers that point out or signal, specific events. If we consider the Hebrew meaning for this passage, the words for signs and seasons are translated as, markers, or signals, that point to God's appointed times, or scheduled visitations, described in the Bible as holy convocations. God's appointments are then described in Leviticus 23, where God details to Israel, the days on which these appointments can occur, in any given year, based on the lunar calendar that Israel uses. For those who study eschatology, the feasts of the Lord is a well-known and understood subject, with lots of information and commentaries available, in bookstores and online. The feasts of the Lord, and the days on which they occurred, are also very important when it comes to understanding the celestial markers, that God has given us. Next, 
we will discover how God uses the celestial bodies in a very obvious pattern, to mark the feasts of the Lord, during the two seasons that they occur in, and how this illuminates our understanding of the events around the timing of Yeshua's crucifixion and John's vision, in Revelation 12. When we study the events around the crucifixion of Israel's Messiah, around 2000 years ago, those who study eschatology, know that the first four feasts, also known as the Spring Feasts, were fulfilled by him, on the exact days that were prescribed in Leviticus 23. He was the seed of the woman, that was born from God's chosen nation, through a virgin birth. He took away the sins of the world, in a time when Israel was looking for a savior, who would free them from Roman oppression. Yeshua's presentation of himself to the nation of Israel, on the back of a foal of a donkey, did not match Israel's specific desire in this regard, and as such, they rejected him as their Messiah. Yeshua was God's perfect Passover lamb, whose blood would be shed once and for all, for the remission of all sin on the day of Passover, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, as prophesied in Daniel 9:24. Yeshua was the unleavened bread, the only person ever to live on this earth without any sin in his life. He presented himself to God, as the first fruits of the harvest of souls that would be resurrected, and have their access to God restored, on the day that Yeshua rose from the dead. Fifty days later, the Holy Spirit was poured out on another appointed day, the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the period of God's church on earth, and issuing in the beginning of the time of the Gentiles. Not only do we have the events that occurred around Yeshua's crucifixion, match the dates of God's appointed feasts, but there are several prophecies in the Old Testament, that pointed to the arrival of Israel's Messiah. This information was entrusted to Israel, so that they would be in a position to recognize their Messiah, when he arrived. Let us look at some of these, that pointed specifically to aspects, that Israel should have been able to recognize. Firstly, Gabriel gave Daniel a specific time frame, for Israel to be in a position, to know the exact date on which they should expect their Messiah. This timing, is given in Daniel 9.25, and is linked to another prophecy, given in Zechariah 9, where a more detailed description of Israel's Messiah's introduction to the nation, is given. Daniel 9 verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. Sixty-nine weeks of years, or four hundred and eighty-three years after the decree was given to rebuild Jerusalem, by Antexerxes, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. In Zechariah 9, we find a description of how Israel's Messiah would present himself to his chosen nation. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. When we look at the events describing Yeshua's entry into Jerusalem, on the back of a foal of a donkey, we start to deal with the specific timing as given in Daniel 9 and in Zechariah 9. These events are described in Luke 19, and specifically relate to the start of the feast days of the spring season. The spring feasts of the Lord started off by selecting a lamb, that would be offered and inspecting it for a period of four days ensuring that it was without blemish, before it was sacrificed, on the day of Passover. Jesus was inspected by various leaders, from Israel and Gentile nations, and was declared to be without any fault or blemish. These events and their timing were accurately predicted by the Daniel and Zechariah prophecies. There are several other prophecies that also point to these events but in the interest of time, we will just focus on the accuracy of the timing and the methodology with which Israel's Messiah, was presented to his chosen nation. If God's word is truly reliable, we would also expect to see God providing a heavenly signal to mark the fulfillment, 
of his appointed times, as prophesied in Genesis 1 verse 14 and Leviticus 23. So, can we find any evidence for such a celestial signal? How exactly, did God mark these appointed times, that were fulfilled by Israel's Messiah? It is truly amazing, to discover that God did indeed mark the spring season of feast days, with a very unusual celestial event. This amazing event is usually overlooked, partly because it does not fit in with our understanding of the solar system, but also because what is described, is highly unusual and often interpreted, as something symbolic only. As a result, this event, as described in God's word, is usually not given the attention, that it deserves. When we look at TorahCalendar.com, a website that is focused on the restoration of the creation calendar, we see that on the eve of Yeshua's crucifixion, there was a lunar eclipse. This in itself, would not be something out of the ordinary, except for the fact, that it was followed by a massive three hour long, solar eclipse, that occurred in the same 24 hour period. This unusual event is recorded in the Gospels, and this is Luke's account of the event. Luke 23, verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. To be fair to those who do not believe that the Bible is God's word, that it contains God's ultimate truth, and that it accurately predicts the future, this event was also referenced in the writings of at least four secular historians, of the same time period during which these events occurred. They are Thallus, Phlegon, Origen, and Africanus. All of them, were respected by their peers, and there is no evidence that would suggest that what they wrote, were in any way manufactured lies. This is what the Greek historian, Phlegon wrote, in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, there was the greatest eclipse of the sun, and that it became night in the sixth hour of the day, so that stars even appeared in the heavens. There was a great earthquake in Bithynia, and many things were overturned in Nicaea. Many people brush this event off as impossible, or requiring a symbolic interpretation to understand, as the moon is full at the time when Passover is celebrated. The fact that this solar eclipse lasted for three hours, and that it was recorded by at least four secular historians, tells us that it was indeed not the moon that caused this eclipse. This darkness that came over the earth, was more likely caused by some other celestial entity. The maximum duration for a full solar eclipse, caused by the moon, can never exceed 7 minutes and 29 seconds. To have a three-hour eclipse of the sun, would require a celestial body of substantial size to move between the earth and the sun. Why did nobody see, a large object in the skies during Yeshua's crucifixion? And can we find any evidence for the existence of a celestial object, that is not commonly known to humanity? If you believe that the elusive object known as Nibiru, Planet X, or Nemesis, is just a subject for conspiracy theorists, then please consider the following. We know from secular media, that NASA discovered a foreign celestial object, or planetary system, with particular attributes, in 1983. This was reported in the Washington Post in this news article. The article describes the discovery of a planet or planetary system, that could possibly be part of our solar system. It was discovered by a telescope on the United States infrared astronomical satellite. It is described as extremely cold, and those who discovered it, could not tell what exactly it was, as it was apparently shrouded in a dense cloud of dust. Another aspect that is mentioned, that probably also resulted from the dust shroud, is that this entity reflects no light, and cannot be viewed with any optical telescopes. It describes the object as a possible gas giant, that could be as large as Jupiter. In 1983, it was estimated to be about 50 billion miles away from Earth. After this point, no further information was provided, until nine years later, when another press release, also by NASA, found its way out into the public domain. In this release, the writer stated the following, 
unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, point to a large outer solar system body of four to eight Earth masses, on a highly tilted orbit, beyond seven billion miles from the Sun. This release provides a little more information with respect to the possible size and the orbit of this object. In addition, we notice that the distance between this object and the Sun, at this point, is estimated to be beyond 7 billion miles away. This would indicate a definite decrease in distance over the nine years between the two press releases. However, the press release on NASA's website was subsequently removed, and is still missing from the online archives, with NASA posting the following excuse on their website. This archive is missing some press releases from 1990 through 1994, though the archive ostensibly links to those files. We are working to resolve the problem and apologize for the inconvenience. NASA has now had more than two decades to resolve this problem, and still has not been able to bring back these missing press releases. If I was a NASA astronaut, I would be concerned about the organization's IT capabilities. The lack of information about this object in the mainstream media, is certainly telling us a thing or two. It is clear that NASA has removed these articles intentionally, to keep this information from the public. But what would be their motive, for hiding this information, given that this was once public knowledge? What do they know that they do not want the public to know? Is this maybe because of this object's current trajectory? and what it could imply for those living on Earth in the years to come. I believe God's word provides this information to us in the prophecy and vision that Daniel was told to seal up. I will show you the amazing information that God has hidden in his word, and what it is telling us about this subject, as we continue. It is then also no coincidence, that many nations have in the past decade or two, sent expeditions to Antarctica to install infrared telescopes. Why the sudden interest in viewing objects in space using the infrared spectrum, by Australia, China, France, Italy, Japan and the USA, who are all working together, on this project? Does it maybe have something to do, with the fact that this object, casts no light and that it can only be observed in the infrared spectrum? Does the highly tilted orbit that was mentioned in the 1992 press release, mean that the object is best viewed from the South Pole? If this object is indeed getting closer to the Sun, as the articles would suggest, it would substantiate the possibility that this object could actually be orbiting the Sun. Considering the observations of the influence of this object on the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, it is logical to understand that these planets will also have an equal counter effect on the unknown entity's orbit. This means that the unknown celestial object could have a slightly different orbit for each cycle that it completes as it interacts with the other planets in the solar system. When we combine this information with what was recorded in Luke 23, and by four respected historians, living in Yeshua's time, we know that this entity's orbital path around the Sun, intersected the space between the Sun and the Earth, during Yeshua's crucifixion. For a specific trajectory around the Sun, given the size of this entity, it would then be very possible to result in a three-hour-long eclipse as seen from Earth. Does the fact that this celestial body, being shrouded in dust, not explain why nobody saw it during the daytime, when it moved between the Earth and the Sun? Does the size and gravitational pull of such an entity, that was perfectly aligned between the Sun and the Earth, not explain why this solar eclipse was also accompanied by so many earthquakes around the world? I think that you would agree that there is definitely evidence, coming from the scientific and astronomy communities, and information from recorded history, that could explain the events that occurred during Yeshua's crucifixion. The fact that information about this object is intentionally withheld from the public, also begs some questions, as to why. I believe God also reveals to us the reason for this, in his word. There is one object to keep an eye on in the months to come that would seem to play an important role in revealing to us whether this elusive object is in fact real, and confirming, 
that what we understand from God's word, is correct. This is the planet Jupiter. The powers that be, may be able to suppress information in the media, but they will find it difficult to hide a planet as large as Jupiter from our view. Let me show you why I think this is important. When we consider the information given in Revelation 12, we notice one object that is not represented within any of today's astronomy software applications. That is the entity known as the Great Red Dragon. Having come to the realization that the heavens provide a physical representation of the vision in Revelation 12, and that each aspect, except for the Red Dragon, described in the vision, has a physical celestial representation, we can with 100% certainty know, that the dragon, will also have a physical celestial representation. Many people argue that the great red dragon represents Mars, but if we look at the alignment, it is clear that Mars forms part of the 12 starred crown, and therefore excludes Mars from playing this role. Just because this object is not visible to us, yet, does not mean that it does not exist. Knowing how God uses patterns in his word, and the fact that we have three instances, containing the same symbology on God's timeline, we know that God's word will provide us with information at one instance, that would either be missing at one of the others, or that would provide additional understanding of the situation, if we combined the two sets of information. When we compare the events that occurred during Yeshua's crucifixion with what is written in Revelation 12, we find that we are missing the physical representation of the Great Red Dragon, in astronomy software that is currently available. At least, this was the case at the time that this video was created. However, when we look at the crucifixion, we see that the Great Red Dragon, is the only celestial entity that is inferred, at this specific instance, and that it is also marking the completion of the first spring feast. This proves to us how God's word functions like a jigsaw puzzle. When we apply the pattern obtained in Revelation 12 to Yeshua's crucifixion, we can immediately identify the object that caused the three-hour eclipse. It was the great red dragon. Similarly, if we apply the events of the crucifixion to the vision in Revelation 12, we know with 100% certainty that the great red dragon is a physical celestial entity, based on the effect that it had on the earth, when it passed between the earth and the sun during the crucifixion. This also illuminates our understanding of what Revelation 12 is telling us. When we now read Revelation 12 with this understanding, we discover that God's word is giving us a clear description of where this celestial entity will be situated, in September of 2017. Revelation 12 verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. When we consider the implications of the first section of this passage, keeping in mind the celestial application, it is clear that this unknown celestial entity, will at some point encounter a substantial amount of debris that will be pulled into its gravitational field on its way to the center of the solar system. Where will this debris come from and what does God's word tell us about this? I believe God has even hidden this information in his word, and it forms part of the prophecy and vision that Daniel was told to seal up, until the time of the end. We discover the answer, when we combine the information, given in the Genesis 3 prophecy, which is the first instance in which we encounter the specific symbolism of this pattern, with that of the vision in Revelation 12. This discovery, I believe, gives us understanding into the reason for this information being suppressed in the mainstream media. It also paints a clear picture, of what we can expect to happen in September of 2017. I am of the opinion, that the prophecy and the vision's description, of what will occur in the heavens, will also have a profound influence in bringing about the events that are described in the book of Revelation. I believe that the information that Daniel was told to seal up, until the time of the end is fundamental in understanding, how God is going to bring about, some of the judgments that will be poured out upon the earth. This is what we read in Genesis 3. Genesis 3 verse 15. 
and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Knowing now, that the information given in this passage, also has a celestial application, I think you will agree with me, that it is crystal clear to see what God is telling us here. This passage describes a collision between Jupiter and the great red dragon, or between Jupiter and one of the objects that forms part of this system. The way in which the interaction between the two seeds are described in Genesis, perfectly fits the description of a collision between two celestial objects. If a foreign celestial body, on its way to the center of the solar system, collides with Jupiter from behind and from below, it would match the description given in Genesis 3.15. Jupiter's heel would be bruised while the head of the other celestial entity would be bruised. As I was searching for some images of Jupiter to use in the animation of this video, God revealed to me something amazing that was totally unexpected. You will remember that in July of 1994, the comet Shoemaker Levy 9, collided with Jupiter. What is really interesting about this event, is the fact that the comet broke up into 21 fragments, two years before it collided with the planet. The second aspect that is very interesting is the position, at which the fragments collided with the planet. If you look at an image of Jupiter that shows this, you will see that the comet basically drew a dotted line, on the bottom section of the planet, where the heel of the planet would be, not to mention the name, Shoemaker, that is associated with this comet. It would seem to indicate, that God drew a dotted line, to mark out the area that will be removed from Jupiter in the upcoming encounter of September 2017. When these thoughts entered my mind I thought that this may be a little far-fetched, and when I was processing this information, I asked the Lord, whether this insight was true and really from Him, or if this was just my imagination. As I was busy asking him this question, he showed me the following verse. Revelation 22 verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. How overwhelming will such evidence be to those who mock and doubt our God and his word? who is truly the creator of the universe and in full control of what happens in the heavens around us. How silly it is to believe that the universe came about from nothing, that suddenly exploded. Here is proof, in the form of a prediction, that those, who are avid supporters of the evolution theory can monitor, to see whether what God has said in his word is true or not. He has told you that he is the creator, and has shown you what he will be doing, before it happens. He has hidden this information in his word, shortly after creating the sun, moon and stars on the fourth day, exactly in the manner that he said he did. I have always wondered, how the destruction that is written about in Revelation, would come about. What would trigger the devastation that would be coming upon the earth as described in the book of Revelation? We have never seen anything that remotely matches the events that are described in this book. What natural phenomena would be responsible for suddenly raining down several large asteroids onto the earth over a short period of time, as described in the book of Revelation? What would be responsible for speeding up the rotation of the earth so that a day will no longer be 24 hours long, but only 16 hours? We see this shortening of days, prophesied in a number of passages. Revelation 8 verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Mark 13 verse 20. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Proverbs 10 verse 27 The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. It would seem that the bruising of the two seeds, that are represented by two planetary objects, partially colliding, would be the single most probable, initiating factor, that would lead into the events described in Revelation. This kind of encounter provides overwhelming support, 
for the resulting destruction that is described in the book of Revelation, especially during the final half of the tribulation period. The amount of debris that would result from a collision between two planetary bodies, as large as Jupiter, would form a devastating tale of destruction behind the incoming system, on its way to the center of the solar system. Imagine the amount of debris that would be generated if the section below the dotted line on Jupiter, was to be removed in a collision. Add to this the debris removed from the incoming object, and all of this mixed into a tale of destruction that will be drawn behind the great red dragon on its way to the center of the solar system. A few years later, this tale of destruction will start to cross the orbits of all the inner planets, including Earth's and will shake the powers of heaven with great signs in the heavens, just as it is written in God's word. Luke 21 verse 11. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Luke 21 verse 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Isaiah 2 verse 19. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Such an encounter, between Jupiter and the great red dragon, explains why those with the technology to study the cosmos, have been preparing deep underground bases, believing that they would find safety deep inside the crust of the earth. The only way one will be able to survive this, is to be under God's supernatural protection, which is specifically promised, to those of Israel, who would heed God's warning and instructions during this period of time. The other option is not being on earth, when all of this will happen, by becoming part of God's family, before he removes his church from earth. For the next encounter, with the great red dragon, it will be a totally different scenario, compared to the time of Yeshua's crucifixion. A partial collision between Jupiter and a foreign planet, that are approaching the inner part of the solar system, could very well account for the events that are described in the trumpet judgments in the 8th chapter of Revelation. This is what we read. Revelation 8 verse 7 to 12. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea, and had life, died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Given Jupiter's distance from the earth, and the speed at which it travels around the sun, it would take an object that travels in a straight line, from Jupiter to the center of the solar system approximately two to four years to reach the sun, if it traveled at a speed, similar to that of Jupiter. This matches the description that we see in Revelation, that places the massive destruction that will occur on the earth, around the middle of the tribulation period, or around 3.5 years after the start of this time period. As this foreign object does not reflect light, it may be difficult to observe until the debris starts interacting with other planets and finally crosses Earth's path. However, keeping an eye on Jupiter, during September of 2017, and in the years following, should clearly reveal evidence of this collision, and this will also confirm God's word, and the fact that the final seven years on Earth, is about to commence. If a collision with Jupiter is evident, those who remain on Earth, after September of 2017, can with 100% certainty, expect to encounter the destructive tale of debris from this collision. God's word is true, and what he has written, 
will be done. It would also seem that God has given the world a one year warning, in allowing us to discover this information now, and show to us that belong to him, how he is able to keep his word that was spoken more than 6000 years ago. It will also serve as evidence to those, who mock him and who rejects his word, that he is the living God, who loves every person on earth that he created, and to save those who accept his gift of salvation, from the coming destruction. One passage, that clearly addresses this, is Jesus' description of the approaching end times, in Luke 21. This is what Jesus said. Luke 21 verse 25 to 28. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. It is amazing when we realize what Jesus is showing us, in the last sentence. God has allowed those who watch for his return, to witness the initiation of these events, before our escape from earth. What an exciting prospect to look forward to, for those who are born again of God's spirit and eagerly awaiting our gathering unto him. This may be a very shocking and controversial discovery, but I believe God is revealing this information to us now, as evidence, to show us that he is real, that he is in control of the universe and that he is more than capable of declaring the end, right from the beginning. He also keeps his promises and shows those who belong to him what he plans to do, before it happens. Amos 3 verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. Isaiah 46 verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else, I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Revelation 22 verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. If you have not done so already, there is still time to accept God's free gift of salvation, that this awesome creator of our universe has provided, to everybody who would accept. Please give your life to him today and become part of his body on earth in the few months that remain, before our time here runs out. I have provided you with an example of how this would be done. You can pray this prayer and ask God to save you today, and to make you part of his family, who will be joining him, before the destruction of the earth occurs. In the next video, we will focus on the implications of this sign for those who are alive, at the time that it occurs, and what to expect in the time leading up to this event. We will also look at some other patterns that will reveal to us whether the rapture is a real event or not. Israel will play an important role in the time following this event, and we will also consider what most likely will happen with them as a nation, based on what God's word tell us. Thank you for watching the second video in the series of God's Roadmap to the End. If you are interested in more information about this, and if you do not want to wait until the next video is made available, please download a free copy of God's Roadmap to the End, ebook, which is linked in the section below. You will find